We are transitioning into the cold winter months and all I can think about are warm and fuzzy winter fur felts. But have you ever wondered, what's the difference between a merino, melusine and salome? Find out in this video. Hello and welcome to a millinery materials video. My name is Ilona, I'm a milliner based in London and today I thought we'd explore the different types of felt available for use in millinery. I will be looking at types of fibres, different types of felt and also felt specific to the hat making industry. So if that sounds like something you might find interesting then please consider liking and subscribing. This helps my channel grow and reach a larger audience. For all my European viewers, this video has subtitles, so be sure to turn them on if you find that helpful. First of all, what is felt? According to everybody's favourite free online encyclopedia, felt is a textile material that is produced by matting and condensing and pressing fibres together. If you think about a woven fabric, it has a warp and a weft. This is the direction of the yarns that are woven together to produce a sheet of material. To turn this into a garment, you cut out 2D flat pieces of fabric and sew them into a 3D garment. When you cut into woven fabric, it frays. If you think about a knit fabric, it consists of loops knitted from a yarn and creates a stretchy fabric. When you knit something, you are creating the textile at the same time as you are creating the garment. When you cut into knitted garments, they can unravel. A felt is neither of those. It consists of separate fibres that are rolled and compressed together. This means that there is no warp and no weft and no nap. This also means that you can cut into it and it will not fray or unravel. It will keep a nice clean edge. Another property of felt that makes it indispensable to hat making is that you can stretch and shrink it. As you heat it up with steam and then block it, you are essentially continuing the felting process, but more on this later. Types of felt by fibre. Now, what about fibres? You can categorise felt fibres into three distinct categories, synthetic, wool and fur. I wouldn't touch synthetic fibre felts with a barge pole. Synthetic fibres are just plastic. The most common form of these are those small sheets of A4 you get for crafting purposes. Sometimes you will find flat sheets of wool felt containing a small percentage of polyester fibres. I've never worked with this type of felt so I don't know how it feels. But that small percentage of polyester is enough to put me off anyway. Then you've got everyone's favourite, classic wool. These days you can purchase millinery felt in standard normal wool or in merino wool. There are many breeds of sheep and each breed produces a slightly different quality of wool. That's all to do with the crimp, which is the squiggle in the wool fibres. Merino wool is very, very squiggly. It looks like it's gone through a crimping hair iron from the 80s. This particular classic blocked beret is made from merino wool and this bottle green beret is made with normal high quality wool. Having worked with both of these types I can say that I can't really tell the difference. They block in pretty much the same way and they also feel very similar. This little cocktail number is made from combed wool felt which I have to be honest, I'm not quite sure what that actually means, but it feels really, really soft. It almost feels like a fur felt. And speaking of fur felt, I know some people will be uncomfortable with the idea of fur in the fashion industry and with good reason. In the case of millinery, the rabbit fur used to make fur felt comes as a byproduct of the European rabbit meat industry. Now feel free to have a civilised discussion amongst yourselves in the comments about whether or not it's okay to use any animal produced items for human consumption. But in this video I cannot ignore the fact that fur felt has a place in historical millinery and in modern millinery more due to its properties in comparison with wool felt rather than it being a desirable luxury to show status. So with that in mind, 
What can fur felt do that wool can't? It's the ease of use with working with it and the surface textures. When you block with fur felt, it melts over the block like butter, and depending on the block, it might be easier to achieve its shape using fur felt. This vintage style bumper berry block is a prime example of this. When I first got this block, I tried blocking on it with wool felt, but I couldn't get the felt off the block once I was done. Then I tried blocking in a peach bloom fur felt, and not only did it take on the shape much quicker, but I was able to get it off the block with no trouble at all. Now that I'm a little more experienced with hat making, perhaps I will try and block a wool felt on this block again, just to see if I can manage it. Before we move on to the next section, I wanted to mention that men's fur felt hats can also sometimes be made using beaver and mink fur. I don't know much about the ethics of this, but it is the most expensive hat material you can get, and it is very much seen as a luxury status symbol. The population of beavers declined across Europe in the 17th century due to hunting them for their fur and meat. It has since recovered due to extensive conservation efforts. These days, I am not sure where one might even buy beaver fur felt for hat making. They certainly aren't available from the suppliers I will be talking about later on in the video. You can still, however, buy modern men's hats made from beaver fur from the fancy hat shops, such as Lock & Co. I got in touch with them to ask about where they source their beaver felt from and got directed to their sourcing principles webpage. Lock & Co hatters recognise the importance of operating to high ethical principles and practices that require animals in our supply chain to be treated with care and respect. We seek to source materials of animal origin, leather, fur and hides from countries that have well established and enforced legislation for animal welfare and trade principles applicable to capture, maintaining, breeding, raising, transportation and slaughter of live animals. All hides used in the production of Lock & Co Hatter's merchandise are a byproduct of the food industry and our suppliers are requested to produce and maintain evidence to illustrate this. I would have loved a little more detailed information of specific countries of origins, but this must just be their standard response to such a question. We all have our own red lines when it comes to materials we may want to use to create hats. My best advice would be to check with the suppliers, ask about the sustainability, production and origins of the materials that they sell. That way, you can do your own research and come to your own conclusions on whether or not you want to purchase the product. You've just heard me use the word peach bloom. Let's have a look at what I mean by that. Peach bloom, also known as velour, is a felt surface descriptor. These days, all rabbit fur felts default to a peach bloom texture. Imagine the soft, fuzzy surface of an actual peach. That's what peach bloom feels like. These felts can be single or double sided, meaning the texture is either just on the outside or on both the outside and inside. You might choose to use a double-sided Vela peach bloom if your hat design has an upturned brim. There are plenty of other fur felt textures that are available. One of my favourites is Meluzine. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Meluzine is characterised by the shaggy long strands of fur that can be brushed out to create a shiny surface, just like on this lady's fedora or deliberately brushed into all directions to retain a fuzzy, fluffy look that was quite popular in the 60s. Just like Vela Peach Bloom, a Meluzine can also be single or double-sided. A step down from the full-on fluff of the Meluzine, we have Salome, also known as Mohair. I don't know much about Salome, as I don't think it's produced anymore. From this tiny sample I have in my collection, I would describe it as a mixture of long and short strands of fur that don't have a definite direction. I have this old mid-century hat that was my grandma's, and I think it's close to being a Salome. I don't know. What do you think? Might it be a Salome? Let me know in the comments. A type of felt that is not produced anymore is tissue fur felt. This is close in texture to a very dense wool felt, but it is thin. 
This is a vintage Madame Paulette authentic reproduction hat. It has a felt maker's mark stamped on the inside. I can tell it is a tissue felt because the maker's mark says fur felt. However, the texture does not feel like a Vela peach bloom. And if I measure the thickness of the trim, it's only about two millimeters. For comparison, modern peach bloom is about 3.5 millimeters. Even though this vintage felt is so thin, it is very, very dense. This density gives it a good weight and structure, but because it is so thin, it feels light and soft. Felt as a hat material. Okay, now you know what felt is, the fiber content options, and the surface finishes. The next important thing to learn about is the hat making material. Terminology here can differ a little bit between continents. I tend to default to British versions of words for obvious reasons. If you are an international viewer and you use a different terminology, please let us all know in the comments so that we can all learn to understand each other and use terms interchangeably. Let's do this as a quick fire round. This is a cone, also known as a hood. It is good for brimless styles such as berets, pillboxes, halos, skull caps, callow half hats, buttons, and cocktail numbers. Now, I have managed to make cones stretch to certain small brim styles, but I wouldn't recommend this as you risk stretching the felt to a point where it might tear. The next step up is an alpine hood. This is a cone that has a very small flare at the bottom. It is used for hats with small brims such as alpines or Tyrolians. This style was very popular in the 1930s. I don't think this type of felt shape is produced anymore. Next, going up in size is a flare. This is directly between a cone and a capeline. Once again, these are good for hats with small brims, perhaps some trilbies. However, I have used a flare to block one of these large berets as I was worried that a smaller cone wouldn't quite fit around the circumference base. And now, capelines. These are giant. They're used for hats with larger brims such as Bretons, fedoras and mushrooms. If you are planning to make a rather large hat, it can be advisable to purchase two capelines. One you would use for the brim and the other you'd use for the crown. You wouldn't necessarily want to order a capeline and a hood as colors can differ ever so slightly between dye batches. Personally, I have found that I can get away with using a single capeline for a brimmed hat. I block the crown first and I make sure to really stretch the felt as far down as it will go over the block. That way I should be left with enough of a skirt to then block the brim. If you are going for the double capeline method, be sure to save all your offcuts. You can use the cut-off brim to make smaller hats like a halo or callow, and the cut-off cap from the brim can be shaped freehand using the veining technique. When purchasing felt as a cone, alpine, flare, or capeline, pay attention to the description. Some suppliers are very helpful and will tell you the grammage and flat dimensions of the product. The grammage tells you about how dense the felt might be, and the flat dimensions will give you an idea of whether you are purchasing enough to fit over a specific block. For example, for this giant 1940s puzzle berry block, I used a giant fur felt capeline just to be sure it will cover the whole surface area. Another thing I wanted to mention are surface decorations on felt. Most commonly, you can get wool felt stamped with animal patterns or abstract designs. Melusine can also be made with a print such as this leopard print beret. Just like felt finishes, stamped designs can be single or double-sided. If you have a look at the cross section of this sample, you will see that the design doesn't sink very far into the surface. The other thing to note about printed designs is that some of them will have a design seam down the side. This is totally normal, that's how they come. You just need to figure out a way to incorporate it into your design. So for example, on this beret, I've just put it side to side. You could choose to put it front to back or even three quarters or something if you're going to cover it with a trim. Just be creative. 
Vintage felts can be found with interesting cutouts such as this mini fur felt cone with perforations from Petersham's. Unfortunately, it is now out of stock. This kind of decorative edge is quite a sweet touch and I can see something like this being used on a mid-century style clamshape hat. Incidentally, this particular felt to me looks like it might be a tissue felt. Other decorations are confetti flex and melange or marl. All of these are put into the felt during the felting process where a different coloured fibre is felted into the main colour. Supplier comparisons. Now you know all there is about hat felt types, but how and where do you purchase them? Please bear in mind this video is not sponsored by any of the following suppliers and I am not affiliated with any of them, so I'm going to give you my honest opinions. I also don't know any suppliers outside of the UK, so if you order your felts from somewhere else, let everyone know in the comments. We can all benefit from sharing and learning together. In alphabetical order, starting with Baxter Hart and Abraham. Their wool felts are produced in the USA where they add a powder stiffener into the felt body that will be activated when you steam the felt. I find this to be a little odd as I prefer to stiffen my own felt so that I can control the level of stiffness depending on the hat model. If you'd like to learn more about how I stiffen my felts, here's a link to a video on that in the top right. As for the quality, I think they must be using a coarser wool type as I can feel quite a bubbly texture which maybe feels similar to a boiled wool fabric. These wool felts aren't very dense. If I shine my phone light through them, you can see it shining through the speckled surface. The biggest plus to Baxter Hart and Abraham is their vast colour selection. They always have so many colours in stock, which is fabulous when you need to access the same colour for a hat model you might remake every season. That is, unless you decide to dye your own felts. The Baxter Hart and Abraham fur felts are produced in the EU abiding by all rules and regulations regarding animal welfare treatment. The rabbit fur is predominantly a byproduct of the rabbit meat trade instead of being purpose bred for the fur industry. They stock peach blooms, suede's mohairs and both plain and patterned melusines. And just like their wool felts, they all come in an astonishing array of colours. One thing to point out about their website is that their prices are listed without VAT and usually when I place an order with them, I do it the old fashioned way over the phone. Parking Fabrics. They've recently had a revamp of their website, so now it's all new and flashy, I'm still getting used to navigating it. Now, Parkin don't list their sourcing information on the website, so I had to get in touch and ask where they produce their felts. They said, the wool felts are designed and developed in the UK and produced in China. They have 5-10% of stiffening impregnated in the wool. They stock the cheapest wool felts I have been able to find in the UK, so I guess it's no surprise that they are made in China. The cones themselves have a similar bubbly texture as the wool felts from Baxter Hart and Abraham. They wouldn't be my first choice in ordering wool felts, but they do have a wide range of consistent colours. My favourite of which is the Orchid Purple. It's just exactly the right tone of cool light purple. If we do the phone light test, you can see the density falls somewhere between the lighter Baxter Hart and Abraham and the really dense Petersham's. Parkin selection of fur felts is made in Europe and considering they look the same as the ones available from Baxter Hart and Abraham, I assume that they order from the same factory. These fur felts are listed as more expensive if you choose to order from Parkins. Petersham's. What I like about Petersham's is all the information you want to know is always right there in the listing. Let's go shopping. Their most popular wool felt is in the cone hood shape weighing 90 grams. These wool felts are made from thick Australian wool and they really do feel fabulous. They are stiffened with one degree shellac stiffener, which I find to be on the stiffer side to what I like but their texture is just so perfect that I'm willing to put up with the stiffness. If I do the phone light test, you can't see that light shining through the felt at all. Their merino wool felts are made in Europe and I don't think they come pre-stiffened as otherwise the listing would probably mention it. 
Whilst the colour range that Petersham stock is not consistent, they do list vintage supplies and this is great. Some types of felt just aren't produced anymore, such as the tissue felt, and the quality of vintage supplies can really surpass modern standards. As I have already said, I would love to hear from you. Where do you order your felt from? Or perhaps you are new to millinery and are excited to order a felt hood and start making. Either way, let me know what you think in the comments. I dedicate this video to my Patreons who commissioned this. Thank you so much for your support. It enables me to make videos for everyone to spread the joys of millinery. And to everyone else, thank you so much for watching, liking and subscribing. See you next time. Bye.